Joining us now is Vijay Prashad of the Tri-Continental Institute. Vijay, thanks so much for being here. How are you? I'm super. So nice to see you. Uh, how is the pandemic doing for you? Uh, well, it's cooled down in New York a little bit, but it's still, I, I unfortunately, I suspect it will come back. How are you doing with it? No, first, uh, I'm not sure about this, Michael, because I don't know you that well. But did you have a beard before the pandemic or is this a pandemic beard? This length is a pandemic beard. I mean, it suits you. It's not a bad look. All right. This is the second week in a row. <laughs> Bill Fletcher Jr. liked the beard a lot as well. Right. And so I, of course, shave every day because um, I think that um, my beard comes in gray. And I'm not necessarily a vain person, Michael, but I would not like to have a big gray beard to be the first thing you see when you see me. I guess it would be overwhelming, but I could imagine that that would have a lot of gravitas to it. I'm not looking for gravitas. Yeah. I'm looking for revolution. Uh, okay. It's a oh, big beautiful. difference. You know, I'm a that revolutionary. A I'm, not a, I'm not a wise person. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this beard fits, I think, I'm, I'm actually, Vijay, I'm a lot of Castro comparisons, <laughs> I got to tell you. Well, when the, uh, when the revolutionaries came from the Sierra Mestra into the cities, they were known as the bearded ones um, because all of them, you know, they, none of them could shave and uh, they all came down with beards. And that's the, the term that was used, barbudos, the bearded ones. So there you are, the bearded so here one. here we are. <laughs> and you'll be, the, you'll be the clean shaven one. I am Che Guevara when he shaved his beard and went off to the <laughs> Congo looking like a businessman. Um, if you look at those photographs, I model myself after the, the Che of the businessman look. I love um, it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we have a lot of time to think about a lot of things in quarantine. Um, is it okay there, though? I mean, is are things going okay? It, it, it definitely, I mean, a couple of months ago, you know, people um, in my sort of not immediate circles, but one step removed were dying. I mean, there was, it was, it was, it was very, really horrible. There was a lot of action. And now it's, now in a way, it's kind of weirdly back to a bizarre kind of normal in New York. Well, you know, you're right. In the initial period of the pandemic, I lost five friends, um, one of them in Tehran, one in Paris, uh, two in New York, actually. Um, and it looked like I thought, you know, I'd lose friends on a regular basis. Yeah. And then that has stopped. And I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, that's curious because, you know, I have a lot of friends and comrades in Brazil and I worry about them daily. I talk to my team in Brazil uh, regularly, I worry about uh, my team in Argentina, where the pandemic has again uh, escalated. Um, it just somehow seemed that there was this initial burst of people that I knew that uh, got the disease and died. And now it seems that other people that I don't know are getting it. But this is a very dangerous situation, Michael, because, well, we know it's a contagious disease. We also know it apparently is not so lethal. And that distinction is important. MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, was far more lethal. I do remember returning from Beirut, uh, coming to see a doctor in the United States. And they said, where have you traveled? And I said, well, I was in Cairo, in Beirut. And they immediately put me in isolation, came in hazmat suits, tested me. Because, you know, with MERS, the um, death rate was 36%. So yeah. one in three people who contracted mares died. That's unbelievable. That's a terrifying number. Can we, I want to talk in a few minutes about Kerala and maybe Vietnam and COVID. But, but first, you know, we're several weeks now into these uprisings that have taken place across the United States after the murder of George Floyd and coming on the tail of the murder of Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery. And, there's been a lot that has shaken out. Um, it was always going to be an uphill struggle to connect uh, the urgent crisis of defunding and racism and policing and connect it to the broader distributional questions that underline and are connected to it, or it would get pivoted into sort of another round of 
kind of cultural skirmishes and so on. And I, and I think, you know, unfortunately we've been trending in that direction, but, but what do you, what do you make of the uprisings, the intrinsic importance of them and how they're playing out? I mean, Michael, honestly, the United States has a serious problem. It has a kind of rot in its soul. Um, This is a a country that uh, from its inception uh, was not able to handle the crime of having human beings as property. I mean, there's not many countries in the world that from their inception were given the opportunity to walk away from having human beings as property. You know, none of the founding fathers stood up and said that we think that human beings should not be property. I mean, that's that, there's, a cry, there's a rot in the soul of the American original story. And then right through, there's never really been an accounting of this. And therefore, punctually, every time there's a particularly grotesque incident of violence by the police, there is a cycle of uprisings. You know, this is a punctual uh, thing. It's not between the death of um, Michael Brown in Ferguson and George Floyd. I'm told that there were there have been, you know, thousands of people killed by the police department, not all African-American, not all Latinos, but thousands of people killed by the police department. That, you know, hurts me as a human being. Uh, that's something that should actually hurt people that a police department would kill so many people. You know, you have a civilization and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using the word civilization a lot, but you have a civilization that believes that it's better to use social resources to put a police officer between food and a hungry person than to just use those resources to feed the hungry person. I mean, Eric Garner was killed because he was allegedly selling loose cigarettes. George Floyd was killed because he was allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill. These are two people hungry, wanting to feed their family. Why not is a civilization find a way to feed the family rather than hire people to stand between food and the hungry? This is a choice that a civilization has made. And the United States needs to look this choice in the eye and say that either we accept this choice or we reject this choice. And it seems to me that when young people, when sensitive people say defund the police, what they're actually saying, Michael, is they're saying, I would prefer to get George Floyd food, then hire a police officer to prevent him from eating. I'd prefer for Eric Garner and his children, Erica and others, I'd prefer them to get resources to have a dignified life than to hire police officers to suffocate him on the street. That's what they're saying. They're not saying, let's get rid of the police. You know, They're not naive, but they're, they're making an argument that the civilizational choice made by the United States is unacceptable. And I tend to agree with them. It's an unacceptable thing. Hungry people should ne- never be prevented from food by a police officer. I think that is a vulgarity, and a vulgarity particularly when it's so much on racial grounds. So in that sense, the United States is a decaying civilization and the young, sensitive people on the streets, they recognize that. And I I applaud them for that. And and that's right. And so when you and we talked with Cedric Johnson about this a couple of weeks ago, moving beyond the technical fix and connecting uh, police violence to all of these other distributional and power questions. And then, you know, we see the way it kind of launches out. And so all of us, and you, you know, you, you'll regularly, you'll see activists using social media and they'll quote tweet some new, you know, silly story, like the golden girls are going to take, get taken off air or some nonsense. And it will, and they'll say, okay, can we get back to defund the police, please? <laughs> and so, you know, going several weeks in, um, as the powers that be start to engage with it, Cedric Johnson called it blackwashing in a piece in the Jacobin. The further we get to, again, a new kind of culture war politics, primarily of kind of elite institutions in the upper middle class, away from the class dimension and the basic humanity dimension of you should not be a target of law enforcement and violence because of the color of your skin. And we're, you know, People have risked their lives. We saw the incredible brutality and viciousness of the police response. But now, you know, a couple of weeks out, here we are back in another sort of, you know, superficial culture war cycle. 
Yeah, but I don't see that, Michael. I Tell don't me. actually agree with that. I Great. feel like um, I, I would. I'd like to say two things. One is I understand that there was frustration over the deep violence, and you know, by the way, rioting does happen. Rioting is not something that happens because it's you know driven by somebody. No, it's a direct reaction to a decayed system. Right. You know, people are frustrated. They're angry. They they just come out. That happens. But then there were these protests organized by often young black women in many cities. They were the principal organizers, not from any political organization, and but they were helped by other organizations and so on. And those took place. That moved into, I think, a very correct uh, questioning of the things that are celebrated in society: statues, for instance, Confederate right. statues. Throw them away. Columbus and so on. You see, my issue is not that. Then it goes into the culture war. I would like a conversation to happen, which is not disappointment with the nature of the movement, but to try to deepen and further and advance the movement. So, where the movement needs to go now is it needs to come back to the old question. And I understand that this old question, eyeballs will roll, people will sigh, but it's the old question of reparations. I mean. Look, uh, reparations is a, it's a very maybe antagonistic word. It's a it's a it's a fighting kind of word, but this is what it means. It means 40 acres and a mule. You know, you promised after the abolition of enslavement, you promised reconstruction. You gave a slogan 40 acres and a mule. If I calculate the price of 40 acres and a mule from 1865 to 2020, it amounts to reparations. You know, what do you need? you need the fact you need to have a serious discussion about the fact that there is enormous amount of wealth in the united states and in tax havens that should be brought into productive use inside the united states you cannot have a country the united states such a rich country where somebody is not able to feed themselves and their family in fact i believe that nobody on the planet earth should be hungry i think hunger is the great abomination of 2020 but if we're talking specifically about the united states michael it is an abomination you know people should be able to go and eat food somewhere you know that should just be a fact there should be no need to commodify food okay so let's talk about that let's advance the conversation i'm more interested in that than in saying oh the whole debate you know the whole struggle has been diverted by the elites and so on i don't care about the elites i don't care about joe biden i don't care about the democratic party they they interest me nothing because they are going to be disappointing always you know that's not the way to think i don't care about their black washing i'm more interested in how do we advance the movement how do young people who have entered into a movement often for the first time in their lives have been politicized how do we show them how do we you know give them a sense of history and say you know what's important get the statue down i agree with you i don't have any problem get columbus down i I'm, i have no problem with that but now let's demand that everybody get fed you know yeah, columbus one side food the other yeah and that that yeah that statues of course those statues should come down but those could be the icing on the cake you know not the 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 sole function you just watched a michael brooks show video subscribe to get them all why wouldn't you don't be foolish click subscribe below and become a patron as well patreon.com/tmbs thanks everybody